The following interview was conducted with Richard B. Borgens, the Mary Holman George Professor of Applied Neuroscience in the School of Veterinary Medicine for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, April 8, 2010 in Stewart Center, the television studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Dr. Borgen. Good afternoon. Thank you. thank you for your interest. And uh, let's start, tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years and then oh, going to uh, high school. Okay, early years, uh, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, while my mother was trying to push my father to make it from Arlington when he was uh, at the, the Pentagon. He was a military career officer, and she was trying to get, get him to get her home to Texas before she had me, her first son. And she made it as far as Little Rock and had me in Little Rock and then went on after she had me to Dallas and never let my father uh, forget it. She said, couldn't you have even gotten to uh, Texarkana? <laughs> because uh, my mother's side of the family are like fifth generation Texans. And uh, my father uh, was a career military officer and um, was um, from the state of uh, Washington. Grew up a poor kid in the Yakima Valley and um, his father was German and Russian uh, ancestry. So I dropped back one generation from me to uh, a grandmother who was born in my, on my father's side in Solokov, Russia. And his father, John Borgens, died when he was a very young uh, boy uh, from, a, um, from pneumonia, which was not uncommon in those days. Mm -hmm. On my mother's side, my, um, my grandfather was a silent movie actor, played with uh, Tom Mix and others, always made cowboy films. His name was Ben Hill, uh, sometimes went by the name Alderson Hill, if you look him up in the old Western silent movie era. And then spent the rest of his life uh, doing very, very well uh, in um, the movie industry, often as a um, um, press agent. So my mother grew up in the rich part of University Park, Dallas, uh, celebrated life, where uh, the people that she knew best were people like Bob Hope, Victor Mature, and Houdini. We have dolls in our family that, that Houdini had given my mother as a little girl. Um, so it's kind of funny, you put together a, a, a debutante from Dallas from a real rich section of town with a celebrity father together with a, a poor boy who didn't speak English very well from the state of um, Washington who grew up nailing orange and apple crates together uh, during the Depression. Uh, that was my family. So there was a blend of, uh, of entitlement and uh, hard work. Um, I went to college mainly in the Texas uh, area. But a little, how about a little bit about high school? Anything? About oh, language? I just uh, yeah. I was a student in high school. Okay. Uh, I don't remember much about high school because I hated it. Okay. Uh, I went to Brian Adams High School in in um, East Dallas. It's now become Dallas. Uh, actually, where I grew up was really sort of um, residential semi farm country in um, around Mesquite and Garland. If people know that area of Texas. Mm -hmm. um, High school was uneventful for me. I uh, played high school baseball, but uh, nobody ever came to the games. Uh, football was the only thing parents would come to. If you had anybody at a high school baseball game, um, it was because uh, they were your parents. Nobody else came. Uh, so I grew up loving baseball, but mainly I was a musician. I played guitar. I made bands. I, I liked to sing and that. play. And later on in college, that took over my life when I went to school. Uh, in college, um, it was during the Vietnam War years, and this was 1963 on. Uh, during those years, those years, it was not a um, uh, what was called a lottery, where you drew your lot and took your number for the draft. In those years, it was the draft. So you got four years of college deferment to be able to uh, either stay in college or do what you wanted. And in my case, in my friend's case, it was to play music and make records. We really had no intention of being good college students. And for that reason, I went to four different colleges with a mediocre record in all of them. But that was mainly so we could make records, tour, make a lot of money. And uh, actually, we did all that. And so if I was able to change it, I wouldn't. I, I learned, a lot about, uh, learned a lot about goals and setting them and working hard at it. Um, Music back then was uh, sort of a national cultural thing with the sure. Beatles, but still to be able to make records at a national level for a good label took a lot of work and a lot of practice and the breaks. And I learned about all of that as a, between the ages of 19 and 25. Very good. So um, every, the, every once the, in a while I bump into somebody, Catherine, that still remembers Can You See Me by The Bricks, 1966. It was a, 
uh, national selling uh, record on uh, dot label. That and, was uh, yours? Yeah, you can actually go to the, you can Google the BRICS, B-R-I-K-S, and find pictures of me when I was 19 and 20. These things never leave. There's always aficionados for early, and I might add bad, early 60s rock and roll, <laughs> and I'm still part of that scene at the age of 64. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's never left me. It's always there. Uh, some of good. our albums and, and records have been re-released over the, the intervening years. But, uh, That's nice. Uh, it, it's kind of fun. I learned a lot from that. I eventually ended up in the Army. I spent most of my time uh, in the reserves after medical training. Uh, and then when I got out, I changed my attitude, uh, didn't want to go back to full-time music, and I chose instead graduate school. And um, here I am. I'm a, I'm a product of, uh, of, of uh, hard work in biomedical sciences uh, and biophysics since about 1969 to 73 in Texas, and I came here in 72 or 73. I've got the, the times mixed up a little bit. Uh, for my PhD. Where'd you do, did you do your master's here too? No, I did oh. a master's at North Texas State oh, so University. Okay. That's now called uh, the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas. Sure. And that's where my master's was done. I immediately left and came to Purdue. Uh, How'd I you finished... have to select Purdue? Did you know about the program? Is that, and you uh, were in the vet school, is that at that Oh, time? no, no, vet oh. school, let me, let me say something after your introduction. Um, okay. I'm in the vet school because we use natural injury models like spinal cord injured dogs, for example, that are hurt out in the world and are treated in a hospital fashion. But I have nothing to do with veterinary medicine. I have no training in veterinary medicine. My, my training's in biophysics. We're in the vet school uh, in part to be able to use these special cases of, uh, of, of, of animals that are hurt and we can develop human treatment for animals and sure. man at the same time. That's why I'm in the vet school. But I'm also a professor in biomedical engineering as well, so my time is split between those two. I trained at Purdue under Lionel Jaffe in the Department of Biology. And uh, my training was in um, uh, biophysics mainly. I concentrated on the electrical controls of regeneration in, um, in amphibians. And after that, I, I, I won an award and was able to go to uh, Yale University as a um, uh, National Paraplegia Foundation scholar. And I had that fellowship at Yale for almost four years. And then after that, I went around the country, different places. And when I had a nice bit of grant money and, uh, and, a, and a growing reputation in my late 30s, I chose to come back to Purdue. The Purdue area has always been productive for me. I was in the West Coast at Stanford. I was in the East Coast at the Jackson Laboratory in Maine, in a New Haven for a lot of time. And I just like the area. I like the university. I like the pace of this university. All universities drive all faculty members crazy. And um, you'll probably cut that from my thing because universities by and large are still bureaucracies. So I like to tell people that the two larger bureaucracies in Purdue that I have personal experience with is the U.S. Army and the Catholic Church. Uh, after that, Purdue is the biggest bureaucracy that I know. And uh, to tell you the truth, Yale was better, but only because there were only 7,000-something students there when I was at Yale. Uh, but the truth is that the pace of this university is lovely. It's low-key. It's conservative. If you're a type A like me, it's better place to be so that you can relax a little of the time. That's right. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, let's talk about your initial appointment, how you happened to come here, and then talk about the center that was established. Then I'll go from there. Uh, it's an interesting history again. I was... Um, uh, Where were you before you, right before right you Right before came? I came here, I was at the Institute for Medical Research, which was a component of Stanford University. Okay. Uh, and, um, but Stanford didn't take care of the Institute, and the Institute was beginning to have money problems. That plus other things in California at that time, which was 1980 or so, sure. I didn't like. For example, I began to look at hard at the facts and I, I had rented a beautiful home up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I had no neighbors. I lived on 11 acres of redwoods. I looked out on my back deck across canyons full of redwood, redwoods and, and Douglas fir, and I knew I would never in my life ever be able to buy that home. And uh, the more I looked harder at the course of my life and what the uh, opportunities for me were, were for me as a uh, 
faculty member, it became apparent that, that uh, the San Francisco area was not for me. And um, so many things, some of which I've already addressed about Purdue, were very sure. attractive to right. me. I was also not a tenure track type of professor. I lived by my wits and I paid my own salary with my grants. So therefore I had government grants and foundation grants and I could pretty much go where I wanted. I had some friends that still uh, at Purdue that remembered me from my time here before. One of them was the um, chairman of the Department of Biology, a man named Struther Arnott. And by the time I ended up at, in, um, in California, Struther was the vice president for research at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And he others and others thought that I was a, a good bet for a young faculty member. So they, they, they got me to join the faculty. And the place where they really needed some young people that were really hardcore basic research was in the vet school. Too much of the vet school for years before had been clinical and it was a plan which was supported by many people in the university, including Dr. Arnott, that we get some uh, people into the vet school that were not involved with, per se, veterinary medicine, but that would do basic biomedical research. research. And by the way, that same change was occurring in engineering also, because Leslie Geddes was brought here the year after I came uh, to actually develop the, um, the biomedical engineering center. So there was changes in Peru, Peru politics yeah. And I'm going to add just one uh, quick story for you about Leslie Geddes, who's recently passed away and everybody fondly remembers at this university. Before he came to Purdue in the seven, early 70s, he was a faculty member and made his career at Baylor University in Texas. And my mentor was a man in Texas that I got my master's degree under, was a man named David Redden. He was a professor of biology at North Texas State when I went there. But he was also a student of Leslie Geddes's. And so I came to Purdue after I finished with David Redden. My major professor was Lionel Jaffe. When we started choosing a committee for me, we decided to add somebody in there from engineering, and Dr. Geddes was, had just joined the faculty, and so Dr. Geddes, Leslie Geddes, ended up on my doctoral committee. So I, I like to say I had a great-grandfather. Uh, uh, that was him. He, he, tre he, he trained my mentor in Texas, and he was on my very own committee uh, a long time ago in the 70s when he first came to Purdue. That's nice. So all of these things sort of came together in an interesting way for me. I stayed at Purdue for a good while supporting myself, but I had a wonderful now retired uh, department chairman named David Van Sickle. And I was a different sort of a faculty member. I was young, I was headstrong, I was probably too bright uh, in terms of science and too dumb in, in terms of politics and being a good citizen within a department. And uh, Dr. Van Sickle really helped me as a young man and uh, protected me from myself and, um, and, and protected and let me develop and build an environment at the vet school where I grew my laboratory from just about five or six people in the, uh, in the early 80s to 30 people now. And uh, it's now a center. And that's because under Hugh Lewis, a former dean, he looked at me and it, when he came, I was not tenure track. He said, you know, this, this fella, he, you know, he's got publications in science, four or five publications in science. We can't, we can't have him not being a tenured member of our faculty. So Hugh Lewis and Dr. Van Sickle squired me through the process. But all the same time, Hugh Lewis and Dr. Van Sickle uh, protected me uh, and allowed me to do some really first-rate research with a lot of people. And until the mid-90s, the end of the 1990s, I paid for all that on grants. So the way they rewarded me is they helped me administratively make the laboratory that was basically mine, that was growing and growing, into a department. Because now we have probably the same number of people as some small departments in, in our university. So we got department head, we got department status, but without the ability to graduate anyone. We had no academic standing, only with research, where we given the department head status. And that's to answer your question, what was the origin of the center? Right. The origin of the center came from a lot of grant money that I received from a foundation called the Spinal Cord Society, and they gave us close to a million to start out with in one year. And then the administrative support of Dr. Lewis and Dr. Van Sickle, and the center was born in 1986-1987, uh, right, and we hired our first <clears throat> faculty then. Sure. Um, 
Where do, go back to the, your research. You, you started it before. You've been working in the similar area on the paralysis sort of thing. Yes. Okay. I, you might want to make a comment on that. That's really the focus. And then let's okay. take it. Okay. Um, let me even drop back and say that one of the things that I, as a young man I became very excited about and uh, became a passion for me was always to study things that other people didn't think were important <laughs> or couldn't see, touch, or slice, or look at anatomy. And for me that was came in the world of physics. So when I was a master's student in Texas, I studied the role of gravitational fields on bone development. And there was a lot of interest in that because the space program had just gotten its start and if astronauts spent very little time at all in in the, in the absence of a gravitational field, their bones were smaller, there was a lot of problems, osteoporosis, and so all of that, uh, I loved it. It's still fascinating to me that sure. we, right. we walk around in magnetic and gravitational fields and electrical fields all day long. We don't even think about it as being important to our bodies, to our physiology, to our brain functioning. These are the things that you can't see and grasp and measure easily, and that always fascinated me. But they're important. But they yeah. they actually weren't so important in science at that time because people, one, didn't have good ways to measure things, and two, yeah. there's much more tangible things like DNA and RNA. You know, that was the revolution in the 60s and 70s right. of uh, the biomedical revolution in, gene in genetics and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and all of that that has to do with um, uh, um, biological chemistry, excuse me for stammering there for a minute. Yes, right. um, when I got to Purdue, I understudied Lionel Jaffe. He was interested in the role of electrical fields in development. And his, his area of expertise was developing and developed a unique device which could measure electrical fields and currents around tiny organisms, even single cells, but without touching them. And so I saw something there that was brand new that nobody ever really had access to. And I was already predisposed to like the idea of, heavens, how can a tiny electrical field that we can barely measure, and we can't see it, we can't stain it, how can that be important to the development of organisms? And that's when Lionel gave me the opportunity to work with him in that area, I chose it because I was predisposed to like it. Right, okay. The area that he put me into is cogent to your question, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry I'm so windy. But I, I worked on the, uh, an emerging area of the way physiology affects limb regeneration in salamanders because they grow any part of their body back. It, the, the old rule is if you take a sal some salamanders in the United States can be six, eight inches long and they can have a leg as big as your little finger. But you can cut that leg off at the shoulder and in nine weeks they'll have a new arm. Wouldn't we love to be able to do that? And I dreamed that if we looked and studied electric currents and electrical fields, that were naturally produced by the salamander around these structures that were growing that we could learn something about regeneration. And as a matter of fact, we made the, some really good measurements in a stream of papers that while I was still in graduate school and just moved into uh, to Yale had already become sort of um, very exciting to a lot of people. I, I was wet behind the ears as a uh, young fella uh, up in Maine when um, the International Reviews of Cytology offered me to do a, a complete, babe, almost book-length review on it. It was good timing because when I first moved to Maine, I didn't have a piece of equipment to my name and all I had was a library. <laughs> so things went very well for me. The transition to spinal cord came with my postdoc. I already had a lot of ideas, theoretical and practical, about how electrical fields and electric currents can transform naturally developing things like organisms and embryos, but also how to apply them and induce regeneration or development. And there was a, a wonderful man, a very famous fellow at Yale named uh, Melvin Cohen, who was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he was another in this group of very distinguished people that saw something in me and brought me there to work on that project with him. We worked on the spinal cord of a primitive fish. Um, the, the reason why is in that primitive fish we could actually name individual spinal cord nerves and know where their origin was in the brain and what their targets were. So it was very different than man. We jumped later when I came to Purdue from fish to rats and guinea pigs, later on to naturally injured dogs in the veterinary clinic, and finally to man. So it really is, in my thinking, um, 
an orderly transition in mm -hmm. thinking from the electrical controls of regeneration in zoology to a specificity in spinal cord, starting out with primitive fish, later rats, guinea pigs, dogs, and finally we published uh, results recently in, um, in, in spinal cord recovery in man using the same techniques of applied electrical fields. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Talk about some of the early, your early research in the 80s when you, and the 90s when you really got started with it over there, and the dog, particularly with the dogs. The dogs were interesting because yeah. we had already done quite a few things. There were several, uh, let, me, let me back up and say there were two lines of research in the country in the early to mid 80s that were being done. One was in, in whole animals and that was me. Uh, I mainly uh, worked with whole animals, whether it was a lamprey fish uh, or a rat or a guinea pig. And there was another group that was working on, on um, several groups that were working on the effects of electrical fields on single cells, how you could direct nerve processes to grow where you wanted them to, or develop ways to manipulate their growth. Now people did that not because they were that interested in manipulating growth, but it was a way to prove that an electrical field was involved, could be involved naturally right. in, in neuron development. I took the two and blended them together, is basically what I did. So I had friends in both camps. Uh, we did a lot with guinea pig models. We developed our own models for spinal cord injury. We did not like a lot of the models in the literature. We didn't want to go down the same unhelpful p pathways that others had been with spinal cord and brain injury for 30 or 40 years. So uh, one of my first acquisitions to our, our, um, our faculty was a really brilliant Englishman named Andrew Blight, still one of my best friends and still probably one of the, the, the best scholars in spinal cord injury in the United States of America, probably the world. And he and I had a lot of fun together for a lot of years writing really great papers and exploring spinal cord and guinea pig and rat. We published, um, uh, we published a lamprey paper, Melvin Cohen and I, as a lead review article in science, in the journal Science. And then seven years later, and I say a mere seven years later, uh, Andrew and I published a paper on guinea pig spinal cord recovery using electrical fields in science. So there was a, a transition over a period mm -hmm. of years. All of that's good, except that it doesn't mean anything to the clinic. Uh, first, we would use a type of electrical field that would promote growth in only one direction. But if you're going to promote growth or changes in a clinic, you need them in both directions because the spinal cord of man, well, of animals, is two-way traffic. Right. Right. And if you want to produce a clinically useful discovery, you have to influence growth or limit degeneration somehow in both those fibers, nerve fibers that come from your brain to your body or from your body to your brain, there's two-way traffic like a superhighway, and you can't become focused on one lane. So um, we decided that we would have to start looking more deeply into clinical spinal cord injury. But neither of us were MDs, and MDs usually thought we were crazy anyway. And uh, we had a few MD f friends, but not many. <laughs> they thought that if you told an MD back then we're going to be able to treat spinal cord injury with an electrical field, they'd go, "Okay, come back. Let's watch some. Let's watch some old old movies of uh, of outer limits." Okay, and uh, that's how they thought about it. A lot of them, but there were some that really knew that we were serious. How we gained traction with medical doctors is we went to the vet school medical doctors who also had a problem with spinal cord injury in dogs. And in the late 80s, those dogs were usually put to sleep. When an owner would be told that your dog has a severe spinal cord injury, that it might stumble around, but it's probably going to be in a cart, the equivalent of a human wheelchair for the rest of its life. Now, it'll do okay in that wheelchair, but by the way, you're going to have to manually express the dog's bladder, take care of their urogenital health, They'll be rehospitalized re over, the over their lifetime for very, oh, oops, stop, the owners would say, and they'd have the dog humanely euthanized. Now, I want to add now that in today's world, late 1990s to today, that's changed a lot. Uh, people's uh, affection and, and, and dedication to their pets is different. But in the late, in the late 1980s, we had a whole group of dogs that were being put to sleep all around the state. And we looked at them as a great resource because they were severely spinal cord injured and their injuries were very similar to those in man. And they happened in 
in natural environments by a, a disc or herniation or an automobile impact. And they were treated uh, at a local veterinarian like by life-saving techniques, which were very common to human medicine too. And they ended up in a referral center like the School of Veterinary Medicine's teaching hospital. Very much like a person that's severely injured, stabilized in a local hospital, yeah, gets transported yeah. to IU Medical Center to deal with the real spinal cord injury. Right. So we had a perfect model for a clinical uh, way to clinically test the utility of our ideas. We did two starting out with, uh, first with dogs. One was the electrical field implanted. We had a large clinical trial. We used naturally injured dogs. Clinicians who have state licenses were the only people that touched the dogs. We were not able to touch the dogs. We provided them tools. They also had dummy stimulators, which were like placebos, so we did real clinical trials. At the same time, we were developing a drug at that time called 4-aminopyridine, which mm -hmm. we had known from earlier work could influence um, rejuvenation or the recovery of nerve impulse traffic in injured spinal cords. And we did that in dogs and learned a lot. We actually saw dogs get up and stand after 15 or 20 minutes after an injection of the drug. It was really quite, the very first drug I saw was a dog that was three years post-injury and if you supported its hind limb, you supported its hind quarters with your hands, its legs would just drag on the ground. It had no stepping or standing ability. And within 15 minutes of injection of the drug, the dog was moving its paws forward and was beginning to build the ability to support itself. And within two hours after the drug's worn off, all back to nothing again. We knew we had something. And to make a long story short, those dogs took oscillating field stimulation for human spinal cord injury, made it possible. We did a second trial of a human use device to meet FDA standards in the late 90s. And then in 2004, we did, we finished with humans and published it. Uh, the same thing happened with the drug. The drug was moved to the first human clinical trials in Canada through friends of ours. And then after that, it took a life of its own. And it was uh, that the intellectual property always is owned by the university. It's licensed out to corporations. Uh, and so those two were our first uh, major successes where corporations took them over now the drug is now, is now called Ampira, and in the U.S. and Canada it may be called Famperdine. And your neurologist will soon be able to prescribe that drug for you, which can e recover even certain walking ability if you have MS, multiple sclerosis. The original utility in spinal cord injury for people that are injured many, many years. This is a drug that's good for people 5, 10, 15 years later. Um, that is lagged behind. But I think it'll eventually, even by off-label prescription, uh, eventually find its way to the spinal cord community. Uh, so we're very proud of that. I think Purdue's proud of it. Oh, yeah. The OFS is stalled at the very end of what we call the commercialization pipeline with the FDA. And whether it'll take six months or take two years to get it finally approved for commercialization, we don't know. This is in the world, again, of bureaucracy and not of science, mm. uh, but it's there poised to be moved to thousands of patients in the U.S. and more in the world. And finally, we have another story which I haven't told, and I won't take up your time with questions. We developed the use of um, agents that can be injected into a bloodstream of an animal or a person that can repair nerve fibers and nerve cells before they have a chance to go on and die. So this is what we would call a very acute treatment, something you'd want to do in the ambulance or something you'd want to do in the emergency ward. The compounds that we've developed are absolutely non-toxic. That intellectual process, a property was farmed out, licensed to a major corporation. And now they have tested their sterile useful drug for injection in normal volunteers to show that there's no toxic side effects and um, the green light has been given basically to move this into the first trials in both brain injured and spinal cord injured patients. So I think uh, 2011 will be a great year for that. For us, we'll see yet another technique that comes from our uh, little center over in the vet school uh, and all of our friends uh, that have been working so hard on these things for many years. The third one will be in human clinical testing 
um, but but in, importantly, not just in spinal cord, but in brain injury as well. I, I just got a letter. It's just funny that right before coming here, yesterday I got an email from a group in, in uh, Pennsylvania that's uh, at a very, very well-known uh, university medical center, a very, very good group of scholars, doctors, and they were inquiring, can they do this now? I didn't want to use their names because all of this is sort of proprietary to the company, which is Medtronics, and I don't want to uh, uh, step on my tongue. But um, I turned them over to basically Medtronics, and uh, we're just going to see this spread, particularly into brain injury, where significantly more people are injured every year. Uh, only about 10,000 new injuries in spinal cord do we get every year that are severe and lifelong problems, but tenfold that in brain injury that are survived. And if we move to other countries like China, the numbers go up astronomically. So there's a great need. I love it that we've been able to do things to help fill that need. And finally, the last thing I'll say about developing things for human treatments, even though I'm not a medical doctor, is that I think it's good for people like me and Dr. Xi and Dr. Young Nam Cho and Andrew Blight and so many, I'm, I'm gonna leave someone out. We've always taken the view unlike other scientists in this area, that there is not one magic bullet. It's not going to be our favorite thing that we happen to like as an agenda. For example, with me, it would easily be electrical fields. I've studied it since I was in my early 30s. Okay. Um, we know that it can't be one thing, one therapy. The, these terrible injuries are just too, com same with stroke, too complicated too catastrophic. It's going to take different ideas applied to a single individual to produce a good quality of life. And I want to add, uh, we don't really talk about cure. We talk about really improving a person's quality of life. If we're able to do that, uh, I will have uh, spent my career and I'll be very happy with myself because for a quadriplegic who cannot feed themselves to be able to feed themselves and I may have used this example when you were talking to me before, but for a quadriplegic with a high-level injury like, like a Christopher Reeve that can't even feed himself, to be able to feed himself is a giant, giant step forward. And if you can feed yourself, you can develop grasping ability where you might be able to grasp a cup. And if you can grasp a cup of drinking water or fluids to consume without the aid of a technician, then you can grasp the hand controls on a car. And if you can be taught to use hand controls in a car with your upper body, then you can leave your room and you can maybe get a job. So I want to point out and make it very clear, we don't That's believe in cure like Humpty Dumpty. It's we believe good. in quality of life and that's the one thing that's been missing for spinal cord and brain people f since World War II. Before World War II, you died of your injuries. Since World War II, we keep you alive in medicine, but we don't have the ability to biologically, biologically change the status of your injury to give you good quality of life. And that now is changing, and I'm delighted for our center to be a part of that change. All right. That's a good point. And it, uh, one thing, does it depend on... Uh, the, the, <clears throat> when the injury had occurred, I mean, are the ones that have been injured for a long time, does, or is it better to be they're taken care of? Great question. Great question. I like to answer that question by saying, we'll just talk for spinal cord injury for sure, a minute. exactly. But I think it also applies equally well to brain injury or to uh, stroke. I'll use spinal cord as an example, though. You shouldn't really think of it as one injury. You ought to think of it really as three or four because the nature of the anatomy and the nature of the injury five minutes after injury is, is catastrophic and damaging and a person's paralyzed. But if you look at two days later, it's dramatically changed once again. Many of the nerve fibers and many of the processes that were still available to at treat the, at the time or shortly after the time within the first 48 hours, that would dictate that you look at that injury and what's left and what can be recovered in a very practically different way in terms of a therapy. And so that's the acute therapy. And we, we try to manage that with sealants like polyethylene glycol or chitosan. But if we wait longer, or the earlier therapies, let's just say they're not effective, okay? If we get into what's called a subacute period, some of that anatomy in the spinal cord's gone now. 
some of those nerve fibers are gone, they're never going to be recovered. Uh, they are literally gone for the life of that individual. They might have been spared early on, but they're gone now. And so now you have to think about, well, can we cause sprouting or regeneration of those fibers right, and get them point. to connect? A wholly different idea in terms of a practical therapy than rescuing fibers that are alive. Now we're going to try to make something out of what remains after many parts of those cells and fibers are gone. And there's also portions of the spinal cord that even after a lot of death and widespread destruction of anatomy, some parts of it still remain intact. Now I'm going to qualify that for you, anatomically intact, yeah. but those fibers don't work. So it would surprise you if I said we could put five quadriplegics, line them up right here and talk to them, and if we talk to this person's uh, injury, we might find that they have very little intact tissue left in their cord, but they're still a complete, can't move anything, can't do anything below, feel anything below the level of their neck. Well, all of those people will look exactly like that. They're absolutely, from the clinical point of view and from a personal point of view, sitting there talking to them, they're all exactly the same, right. except this person on the far end, maybe they have an enormous amount of spared spinal cord tissue, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't make any difference. So in spite of that, that they have more spared tissue, what we call white matter, fibers, in their spinal cord, they look and they're behaviorally identical to the first person who has very little. Now we attack that with drugs that can rejuvenate or restore the ability to make nerve impulses in that uh, lingering, anatomically intact, but non-functional spinal cord. And this is where you get into some real miracles for some people. Because if we give the person at the first who has very little spared white matter, and we give them this particular drug, and I'm speaking now like formenopyridine, which now is called, I just told you that you're going to have to a cut a lot of me out of here, okay. Rob. Okay. <laughs> I get okay. off telling stories and I forget where I am. Uh, if you go to this first person and give them that drug, it's likely they may have very little response because there's very little machinery left in their white matter left to work with. But remember, this guy looks the same as this guy right. or this young lady. And if we give them the drug, who knows what they might be able to do. We've seen some pretty miraculous things happen. And it all depends upon how much machinery is left. But the most important to underline as a direct answer to your question is, you know, these people can be three, four, five, ten years post-injury. So we have a very different approach mm -hmm. to the long-term injuries. So. You're really talking not only about different kinds of therapies, but you're talking about therapies that would apply, that are very, very different, but would be applied at different times after the injury to be useful. And I hope that that's not too windy a question, answer to your very brief good. question. I think that's very good for the average person because why, if it works on this one, why not on others? You have, there are a lot of factors that come into play, and I think you've addressed Absolutely that. Right. I think that's very good. Uh, with the Let's see. Um, how about our, <coughs> the? You gave a talk on spinal cord. The campus accessi accessibility research team is that still going? That student organization is that uh, something that uh, you recall was in the late '80s and maybe not. Yes. It may not be. A I, I've. Um, let me say a different way. Answer that question a little bit okay. obliquely. Um, I have been greatly influenced by the numbers of young people. By the way, the, the, the mode, the most frequently occurring age of injury for spinal cord injury and brain injury in the United States is 19. So this is an epidemic amongst young people. And I've always been inspired to the point of tears by the stories of so many young people that I've met as members of different foundations. Right. The older I got, uh, the less I was involved in a lot of the politics and foundation work and things that have to do with spinal cord and brain injury as a sort of semi-political scientific movement. Um, so I have not dealt a lot with people in assistive technology. I, I have a young uh, man who's an assistant professor in our group named Brad Durstock, who himself is a quadriplegic. And a good portion of, of what he likes to think about and work, and his work, he's a biomedical engineer by training, 
is in assistive technology. Uh, we think it's very important because until there's something that can really change the scope of what a person can do, we're going to need assistive technology. Right. So I'm a big supporter of it. I have not speak, spoken to many groups since the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, I don't really need to because Brad does. Sure. Uh, so I hope that's a, a yeah. reasonable answer. Good point. All right. And you addressed the point. Uh, the human, now 2,000 year human trials, do you think, have they started that? Or are they doing any? Or well, one of the, um, I think you're referring to the, to the use of the stimulator device. Okay, right. That's been Starting concluded. To, okay. And that, those trials in people uh, that were severely injured were beneficial to them. Excuse me. And those were published. We've done more patients since then. In fact, some of the times we get pulled into things that are rather interesting. Um, one of the last people that we imp that I say we implanted, that's not a mouse in my pocket, of course the clinicians implanted them with devices that we made, uh, was a, a Spanish uh, motocross um, champion in Barcelona. Uh, in the United States we have NASCAR. In Europe they have motocross, motorcycle racing. and. Uh, we, this fellow was uh, a champion amongst champions there, and um, uh, it would be like taking our most famous uh, NASCAR driver and, and rendering him quadriplegic after an automobile accident. Well, that happened to two, actually, very, very well-known. One, the national champion in, in, in Spain, and he was implanted uh, a couple years ago or so, and another uh, motocross person was. And this happens sometimes because the, NI, the uh, FDA will grant you compassionate exclusions to be able to do things on compassionate grounds. And you're not allowed many of these, but if you would probably guess, you can see that politics and who it is comes into play. Uh, we have done some compassionate exclusions. We're not able to talk about those people and how they fared because they're not part of a published study. But we've done some younger people who were younger than the minimum age of 18, one right here in Indiana. Uh, so there's a larger number that we've done than the ones that were just published on. Mm -hmm. And we're preparing a paper right now uh, that's going to look at the history over a lot of people now and the success of this device. So um, when you ask, have the human trials been where their status, I'll answer it by saying not only have they been done, but more people than you know of have been done. Right. And it's in the final stages uh, of being approved by the FDA for, uh, for use. So we're very close again to seeing something within a matter of years that a, a spinal cord surgeon can uh, uh, acquire and use as a part of a therapy. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about December when you became the Mary Holman George. Oh. That congratulations. Yeah, That's thank you. Nice. Um, That's very nice. Who you should actually thank is Mary Holman George. So I don't know if Mrs. George is watching this, but Mrs. George, thank you for everything you've done for our vet school how did it, and did, our center. Uh, how did it Mrs. Come to George, you? you should know, is uh, the Holman Foundation and her. Uh, it's a philanthropic, philanthropic Indiana family that goes way back. Uh, Rose Holman Institute. Uh, there's a endowed chair in obstetrics gynecology from her mother at IU Medical Center. Uh, she's also had a lot of horses and she used, and she's been a patron with her dogs and horses at the School of Veterinary Medicine. She has two homes, one in Ocala, Florida and one in Terre Haute. And then of course she also, her family independently owns the Motor Speedway. So when you watch the, the, um, the woman who takes the microphone and says, gentlemen, start your engines, that's Mrs. George. And uh, years ago, uh, many years ago, I'm going to say almost a decade ago, um, she had a grandson who became spinal cord injured. And uh, he was not in very good shape, and she wanted to be able to get someone to help her work through what the surgeons were telling her. You know, when you, a family member, and you talk to neurosurgeons and neurologists, they have neurosurgeons speak, and they have neurology speak. And sometimes, if they're, the better they are, sometimes the more impenetrable is the story they're telling you about your loved one. And what she found in me was basically a good interpreter. And so, I helped her a little bit. Not very much at all. I'm not going to overdo anything, my part of it, but Whatever I helped her with and said to her, she remembered it. And then 
decided... And it, meant something. it made an impact. It meant something. It, it meant something to right. her, and she later uh, made a wonderful gift to the School of Veterinary Medicine to support an endowed chair. The important thing about that chair, it was the first one in our vet school's history, because the vet school's not an old school that produced from the 50s. Right. You can go to endowed chairs in engineering, and there's many in other chemistry, but not, not in the vet school. So she stepped in, and she didn't just endow a chair in the vet school for neuroscience, neurology, neurosurgery. I was the holder of the vet school chair, she named me. But she also took her millions of dollars and endowed a second chair at the same time at the IU School of Medicine Division of Neurosurgery. She did it because she wanted to see more crosstalk. She wanted us to see more things that we have done. For example, the human trials. I, I made a terrible omission if I didn't tell you that the published human trials were done at IU Medical Center there Division is a tie of Neurosurgery, and they were done. You had a joint arrangement between. We had an arrangement, right. and the the professor there, named Professor Scott Shapiro, who's a neurosurgeon, and holder of an endowed chair there, uh, she granted yet another endowed chair to to that to encourage our cooperation. So, M Mrs. George is a. Um, an absolutely wonderful individual who has always been a supporter of ours and and of injured people in particular. Um, and so that's how it came to be, and our status is we still send her things, keep her informed about things. Uh, occasionally she lets us hold a, uh, a scientific meeting with her present at the racetrack, and that's great fun because I'm a gearhead. I love to build hot rods. So. Uh, Going to the Indianapolis 500 for a business meeting is kind of a dream came true. <laughs> uh, a couple of other awards. You got this. Let's talk about the Sagamore. You got the Sagamore of the Wabash. That's I don't know like... how. You know. Uh, let me talk about all of my awards and whatnot. Yeah, there's two interesting stories for you there because there's a long <laughs> list of them. I'm embarrassed by how many actually. Uh, the truth is, is that uh, I like to tell people that if you live long enough, you're going to accumulate a lot of awards, and uh, and I'm sort of long in tooth in my area. I've been studying <laughs> spinal cord since I was in my late 30s. But some do mean something to you, and um, one of them was the Spinal Cord's Annual Medal, Spinal Cord Society's Annual Medal right. uh, for Humanitarian Service. I really love the way that that was achieved and, and what it meant to me. Uh, later on, receiving... Um, uh, the Sagamore, which is, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, we have Sagamores in our university here. Sometimes more than uh, one is granted to an individual. Uh, I used to work with the former vice president for state relations named John Huey, and I think John had two or three. Uh, former uh, provost, uh, Bo uh, Ringle, Dr. Ringle had one. They're reserved for as Indiana's highest uh, award for civic duty. And um, to receive that, and it was signed uh, by Evan Bai, and a lot of the supporters of that I did not know. I mean, it's, some of these things were done right. by people that watch you from afar. Mm -hmm. But I've, uh, always, um, I've always been appreciative of that because it was an award that really had to do more just with the science. I kind of figured I'd write a good paper or two in my day and might get an award <laughs> for one, but I never thought that the state of Indiana would smile upon me, and so that's a very important right. thing to me as well. I'm going to ask you about uh, your hobbies. Tell about the cars. Your, I oh, I have too many hobbies. You know, um, I am a type A. I don't sleep very much. I can't do the science thing all day long and all night long, even though I'm up most of the day and half the night. Sure. So I have a lot of hobbies. I still stay up with my guitars and uh, mandolin and banjo. I don't play mandolin much. I used to be pretty good at five-string banjo, you know, the old uh, Lester Flat Earl Scruggs type of thing. And I was always a very good guitarist, and I like to say with practice I can be again, and I have a huge collection of um, vintage electric and acoustic guitars, so I'm still very much into my music. Uh, I collect butterflies since I was seven years old. I'm 64, and I still collect butterflies. And uh, to me, they're little pieces of nature's agates that are flying around us and that, that, that are wonderful. And I trade around the world for butterflies, so I have... I have somewhere between, I've said as much as 5,000, but that was before my last move. I think I have somewhere between three and 5,000 uh, <laughs> tropical butterflies of every conceivable size and color that you would ever imagine. Uh, many still in papers and several hundred on display in my home, so I love that. Uh, I collect old militaria and military guns because I love history. 
And to me, if you want to really study the geography and the history of the world, study military history because almost every, every geographical boundary known to man was decided by a military engagement. So by studying that, you get a lot of political uh, history as well as uh, other Comes kinds of it. geographic kinds of history. And for me, it's not good just learning about what occurred in the, in the uh, war between the states. I, I, I go farther. I'm, I'm obsessive compulsive, so I have to have a, a complete captain in the Army of the Potomac's uniform. My, my wife says we now live in a museum. She, she takes uh, some affront at the numbers of mannequins around the house with, uh, with Spanish-American War military uniforms that are complete. <laughs> Uh, Civil War uniforms that are complete. So I'm an obsessive compulsive when it comes to these things. Um, I love cars. I I have a really good friend here in Lafayette that's been keeping me out of trouble or getting me out of trouble for 25 years or longer named John Gams. He's a well-known attorney in town. And uh, John is a real car aficionado and he has the income and the knowledge and the ability to have a huge car collection of antique cars and fire trucks. I think he has up to 40 cars and over a dozen fire trucks. <laughs> now these are not like my cars, which are beaters, and they have to be restored. <laughs> John's are, are, are wonderful, and so I always wanted to, to be a man like John, because I'm crazy about automotive history, too, and automotive, automobiles. My favorite cars are Studebakers and LaSalle's. Both of them are gone now. Uh, and, uh, but of course, I'm a college professor and not an attorney, and uh, John can do it and I can't. <laughs> Personally. I've had lots of antique cars, but I what because I uh, have to sell one to get another. I, I would love to be able to put them in a nice barn like John does, but I can't. So I have to build one up, make it literally look good, and then sell it for as much as I can to step into a basket case for a yet a better model. So the two that are my favorites right now are, are a 1946 Ford Business Coupe, completely finished out, and a 1969 Corvette convertible with side pipes, Ooh, if you know super. that. Uh, black convertible, black interior, and I love it, but I'm still working on it. Okay. I'm going to let you make the final comments and anything that I forgot to ask that you'd like to share, or something, or go back to it, or leave it up to you. I'm um, very thankful to you, Catherine. This is your, your top, not me. <laughs> no, uh, for your interest in whatever I do, but more often uh, I, I want to say basically two things. First, I attract a lot of attention because I'm garrulous and because I'm out there and I still am a Texan and I like to wear my cowboy boots. And so a lot of attention is directed upon me by this university and from the outside. But I want to see here and say here for posterity that the real success of our center are for lots of young people between the ages of 26 and 33 or 34 who come to us as doctoral students, doctoral candidates, postdocs, who become missionaries, as it will. They, they buy into my mission and they buy into some of the other faculty members in our group's mission. And it gives them more excitement. It ends up with more creativity and hard work. And we're extremely productive. And what carries us forward and who does the brunt of the thinking and the brunt of the doing are those young people. Too many to name here. Uh, so many have been the real bright spots of our group. And then my fi faculty colleagues. I have the fortunate position, Catherine, of being a spokesman for a, a group of absolutely wonderful people. And uh, I, I, I often say, people, if you really want to know who's really doing the work of this center, go to our website and look at all those faces. That's the first thing I want to leave with people. Um, I'm the spokesperson for a lot of... Uh, wonderfully educated and wonderfully creative people. Um, the second is, and I've already said it, and that is I don't want to leave the impression that our work is going to lead to a therapy that your neurosurgeon can get and boom, uh, after that therapy you'll be out after a brain injury or a stroke playing basketball. That is not in the cards. I'm not a negative man, but I'm going to say in my lifetime and even the lifetime of some of my students, that's unlikely to occur. Mm -hmm. That is outside our grasp, being a practical working scientist who knows this field well. But what is in our grasp and is happening now is a new revolution with the focus shifted to quality of life, where we can do 
something. So. Many things for the quality of life. I'll give one last anecdote, which I should have gone earlier, and maybe, Rob, you can patch this in. A lot of people don't understand what spinal cord or brain injured people go through. We who are able, people that are injured call us TABS, T-A-B-S. That stands for temporarily able-bodied <laughs> because we can be hurt too with a fall down the stairs right. or, a mis, or a misjudgment of how fast another person's going in a car. What's their life that we think of as, as, as uh, impoverished always seems to be centered around movement or whether they can walk or not. Upper limbs for quadriplegics are everything. Upper limbs for quadriplegics are everything. I want to underscore that. Brad Durstock, who is a C4-5 quadriplegic and has no normal control of his arms and hands, he's quipped, and I put it in one of my books, he said, a cure for me is to become a paraplegic. Think about it for a minute. A paraplegic has the upper body and can use their arms, but no legs. They're still in a wheelchair. A cure for Brad is to get his upper torso back. That's a cure for him. And he says it in a beautiful way. A cure for me is to become a paraplegic. Other people suffer, suffer from terrible pain. It's called neurogenic pain by the practitioners. It's pain which is poorly understood. It's not generated because you're injured. It's generated by the brain. The brain generates these sensations of pain because normal pain, normal pain sensation is cut off. The things where you might step on a tack or feel a rash or even cut yourself or burn yourself, those messages don't get here. And in the absence of normal pain messages to the brain, the brain, wouldn't you know it, creates its own. So the brain creates pain and in some of the same ways that you've heard People talk about a phantom limb. If you have an, a leg amputated or an arm amputated by accident or design, some of those people say, you know, that arm that gone, that's gone, that hurts me so bad. And that's because the arm right. is imprinted into the brain and the brain, the brain abhors a vacuum. So it creates the pain in the arm from the arm that's not there. And for the person that can feel nothing below their neck, the brain creates pain that's not really there. And how many people, the estimates range from 50% on the low end for quadriplegics, it's even suggested to be higher, as high as 70%, have neurogenic pain. Okay, can't we treat it? The answer is sadly no. Most of the time we can't. This is generated by the brain. We can't give anesthetics and things like that, Anal, excuse me, analgesics and things. Sometimes this is untreatable. I know a young woman that wrote me several letters, a quadriplegic in Ohio, that said that she would be able to live a happy, normal life, that she would be grateful for everything she could do if someone could just get her out of the pain. That was her whole world, was that pain. And one of the things one of our new, uh, uh, our new therapies does is to cut the level of that pain down. Uh, for the last 18 people, I think we had one person out of 18. That's compared to normal 70% of the population. So what's important to us is things like that, any little bit that we can gain back. And so that's a windy end to me. Uh, you ask me, I'm a professor, I'm a Texan, and I'm, well, my mother says that I'm not really a Texan, even though I grew up mainly in Texas. Uh, <laughs> George Wadica, the um, department chairman of uh, biomedical engineering, once embarrassed me in front of everybody saying he likes to talk about his cowboy boots and being from Texas, but actually he was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> and right then, Margaret Hill flipped over in her grave a couple of times, you know. <laughs> so uh, you knew when you got me, you'd get a talkative fellow. I want to thank you very much, okay. Dr. Barnes. It was very good, very Thank good. you very much. <laughs> I, I know you. you won't use all that, but maybe you'll it's have some fun. Good.